Hello, and welcome to Lecture 3 of Periodic Motion in Phys 1104. In this lecture, we're going to look at the functions for position, velocity, and acceleration of a simple harmonic oscillator. So let me just remind you that in the last lecture we found this idea that a simple harmonic oscillator follows the motion of an object undergoing uniform circular motion. And so we can define this reference circle, which is a circle of radius equal to the amplitude of the simple harmonic oscillator, and we can imagine an object undergoing uniform circular motion around it. And the tip of an arrow that we call the phaser follows that object. And now we can see that the position of the object we're interested in is always equal to a sine phi, where this angle phi is a thing we call the phase. So the position x is just a sine phi, and a is a constant, and so all we need to do to figure out our position as a function of time is figure out how the phase varies with time. But I'll note that the phaser is pointing at an imaginary object undergoing uniform circular motion. Let me stress uniform circular motion. It's going at constant speed. And so that means that the phase phi must increase at a constant rate, which means it's a linear function of time. And so our phi of t must look like this, a linear function of t, where this phi i is a thing we'll call the initial phase. It's just the value of the phase at time t equals zero. And the funny looking W-like letter, which is not a W, it's the Greek letter omega. That's the Greek letter that says O. That's what we call the angular frequency. It's just the rate of change of the phase. And so there is our position as a function of time for a simple harmonic oscillator. As I said earlier, experimentally, we see that it's a sinusoidal function. So the reference circle relates to the graph of the position versus time as shown in this diagram, where you can see that at some initial phi i, which is the value of the phase at time t equals zero, the position of the simple harmonic oscillator is a sign of the initial phase. And at some later time, when the phase is some omega t plus phi i, then the position is just a times the sine of that new phase. And note also in this graph how one full cycle takes us back to the original position of the oscillator, which also corresponds to the phaser going one full turn around the circle. Well, the phase phi is an angle, and so the angular frequency omega is an angle per unit time, and so we could talk about it in something like degrees per second. But that turns out to be inconvenient. There's a far better choice. And to see why, let's just note that as an object in simple harmonic motion goes through its equilibrium position, then it's moving at its maximum speed. And at that moment, the phaser is going through phi equals zero. And since they're both going at the, in the same direction at that moment, that tells us that the speed of the phaser must equal the maximum speed of the oscillator. And so we can get a relationship between omega, the rate of change of phi, and the maximum speed of the oscillator if we can find a relationship between the rate of change of phase and the speed of the tip of the phaser. Well, I'll note that if we measure angles in radians, then the angle is just an arc length divided by the radius. That's the definition of the radian, and I hope you've seen it before. Whether you have or not, though, I'm going to give you a more concrete example. Suppose we have a runner going around a circular track with a radius of 100 meters. Then when she's gone a hundred meters around the track, she's traveled a distance equal to one radius, and so she's gone through an angle that's equal to one radian. When she's gone 200 meters around the track, she's gone a distance equal to two radii, and so she's gone through an angle that's two radians. And similarly, when she's gone 250 meters around the track, she's gone two and a half or 2.5 radii worth of distance, and so she's gone through an angle of 2.5 radians. That's the meaning of a radian. 
And notice that angles and radians are unitless because you're taking an arc length, which is a length, and dividing it by a radius, which is another length. So really, when you put a label rad or radian on an angle, it's not really a unit. It's just an explanation of how you calculated that angle. So this gives us a very convenient relationship between arc length and angle, and that also gives us a very convenient relationship between speed, which is just the rate of change of arc length, and d theta by dt, that's the rate of change of angle. That's an angular frequency, omega. And so we can see now we have a relationship between the speed of the tip of the phaser and omega, the rate of change of phase. And that was the whole point because we have a direct relationship now between the maximum speed of an oscillator and the speed of the phaser, and it's just a omega, as long as omega is measured in radians per second, which means the phase phi has to be measured in radians. Well, now that we know our position as a function of time for simple harmonic motion, it's very easy to get the velocity and acceleration as a function of time. Remember that x is a x component of position, and so vx is just the time derivative of x. And that a, the amplitude, is a constant, and so the derivative just comes right through it, and we have a derivative of a sine. Now, you may have just studied this in your Math 1105, but if you're not in 1105, you may not have studied this yet, or maybe you took your calculus course last year or the year before, and this is kind of rusty, so I'll tell you or remind you that the derivative of sine is cos, except here we have d by dt of sine of a function of time, and so there's going to be some chain rule that happens. But that's an easy chain rule, because remember phi is just a linear function, and so all that does is bring out, bring out a factor of omega. And so there's our vx as a function of t. Similarly, our ax is going to be the derivative of vx, and that's going to go in much the same way. I'll remind you or tell you for the first time that the derivative of a cos is a negative sign, and there will be another chain rule, and so there's another factor of omega that comes out, and there's our acceleration as a function of time. These are the basic kinematic equations for simple harmonic motion. Once you know the position, velocity, and accelerations as functions of time, you can figure out pretty much everything else about a system. And notice that we derived these without reference to any specific simple harmonic oscillator system. We just noted that simple harmonic oscillators follow objects in uniform circular motion, and we used that, and that'll be true for any simple harmonic oscillator. And so these apply to any simple harmonic oscillator at all, whether it's a mass on a spring, or an oscillating surface of coffee in a coffee mug, or a ball in a bowl, or two atoms in a molecule vibrating. Let me just focus for a moment on the position and the acceleration equations here, and notice that the acceleration contains a sine of the phase. Well, that's just x, and so we can rewrite the acceleration as nothing more than negative omega squared x. And note that the acceleration is just the second derivative of the position. And so what we've done here is relate the position as a function of time to its own second derivative. This is a very important equation. We call it the simple harmonic oscillator equation because simple harmonic oscillators follow it. The reason it's so important is that for any system, if you can show that it follows this equation, then you've just shown that it behaves like a simple harmonic oscillator and has sinusoidal solutions. This is an example of something called a second order differential equation, and lots of you will have a whole course on differential equations, and the simple harmonic oscillator equation is one of the equations you'll study in that course. So now that we know that the acceleration is related to the position by this simple little formula, we can do something else with it. If we multiply both sides by the inertia, we see we have an ma over here on the left. Well, we know what that is. That's a sum of forces. 
And so this is telling us that the sum of forces is proportional to x, in other words it's linear, and this negative is saying it's a restoring force. So the simple harmonic oscillator is subject to a linear restoring force. Well, we already knew that. In fact, we defined a simple harmonic oscillator as an object subject to a linear restoring force. But I had a reason for doing this aside from reminding you of something important that we already knew. Because let's now think about just the mass, the object oscillating as our system. It doesn't have to be a mass on a spring. I want to keep this very general still, but I want to make clear that it's just the mass that I'm treating as my system. And so if I integrate the forces with respect to x, that's the work done on this system. But since the system is just a moving mass, then it can't have any internal energy, and so the work done on it is just the change in its kinetic energy. So here's this integral that we need to do to calculate the work done by all the forces acting on the harmonic oscillator. And this part, m omega squared, is just a constant, and so it comes out in front of the integral, and we're left with one of the easiest integrals possible, the integral of the function x. And so if we're going from some initial x, x0, to some later x, x1, we want this area here that I've highlighted in purple. And this is another one of these integrals that you can know that you can do without knowing any calculus. And I guess we could divide it into a rectangle and a triangle, but there is an even easier way with this one. You could think of it as this big triangle and then subtract this smaller triangle from it. So if you do it that way, then you have a half base times height for this big triangle. Well, its base is x1, but it is the function x, and so its height is also x1. And so that's just a half x1 squared. And now we have to subtract this smaller triangle from it, and it's the same thing. Its base is x0, and its height is also x0. And so there we have it. That is the integral done. That work done by forces acting on the oscillator is going to let us write down a very simple expression for the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator. What we're now going to do is instead of thinking of just the mass as our system, we're going to include the agents of the forces acting on the mass. Now I'm drawing, or I'm showing a mass and spring system, but I'm not actually using that these are spring forces, so the arguments I'm making are general to any simple harmonic oscillator. That work we calculated was a work by external agents, but now they're internal. And so that means it's representing a change in potential energy of things inside our system. Let's define x0 as equilibrium. And remember that we can define potential energy to be zero anywhere we want. And so let's define the potential energy to be zero at equilibrium. So the system potential energy at a position x is just this, which looks an awful lot like the spring potential energy. But remember, that's just because for any uh, stable equilibrium, the, the forces acting on the oscillator look just like spring forces for small oscillations about it. And so our total energy is just a kinetic energy plus this potential energy that I've just written down. Now let's use our expressions for the position and the velocity, where I'll just remind you that the arguments of the sine and cos is just what we're calling phi. That's the phase, and so I'll just write it that way. And so substituting those into the energy expression, I get this, which may look like a little bit of a mess, except notice how many common factors there are. So if you pull out the common factor, you have a cos squared phi plus sine squared phi. But you probably know the identity that cos squared of something plus sine squared of the same thing is always one. And so that just drops out, and we have this lovely, simple little expression for the energy of the simple harmonic oscillator. And notice that one of the main things it tells you is that the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator is proportional to the amplitude of its oscillation squared.